What's going on? What's going on? What's happening? What's happening, blues peoples? This is yet again Jack Dapper Blues Radio. Jack Dapper Blues Heritage Radio. What's happening, Brooklyn? I'm good. I'm good. He's he's over there <laughs> EQing and Injian. <laughs> <I'm good. laughs> hey, how you doing, man? Now we, we have a yet again another special guest, and this is a two or four time uh, New York Blues Hall of Fame inductee. I think two. Two. Okay. Okay. I just I want to make sure I got two. the the, the yeah, numbers yeah, right. Yeah. Now, now this brother. If you want to talk about New York blues? We are sitting with New York blues right here, and I don't even care if I'm well, seen right now. It doesn't even matter. Well, you're very Cause this, gracious. I'm, you know. Well, no. Look, man. My wife. First of all, let me just say we're sitting with Michael Hill. Okay. Let me just say that before I get into the story. All right. Because my wife and I. Tried to get somewhere in Jersey to see you play at this church, uh, like this church resort for a festival, ah. and I, I I took what I thought was a shortcut, but everything was blocked off because of construction. Right. right <laughs> so then right. we had to take the local route to Crown Heights, and then we tried to get to the Holland Tunnel, and that was backed up all the way to Bowery. Wow. By the time we found this place, because, of course, we had to find it. <laughs> right, right, right. It started raining. We got out the car, got in the church, and everybody was shaking hands and hugging. I was like, God dang. <laughs> yeah. I remember that, man. Yes. You guys came we, out. Yeah. We we was, were trying was, to get there, man. Oh, we'll appreciate that. We... But because of a good brother, Pete, Pete Cummins, he told me that you were going to be at Terror Blues. And I went yeah. down there to meet Pete and, and his wife, yeah. and you did a rendition of Robert Johnson on an electric guitar that I have not yet forgotten and have never tried to play because I didn't want to tear it up. Oh, <laughs> man. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So let, let's let's talk about your story before we get into all the cultural and traditional stuff because you—, you um, are you still, or were you at one time on Alligator Records? We were on Alligator Record for, Records for three albums, our first wow. three with the Blues Mob. It was wow. a lot of fun. I'm still friends with Bruce A. Glower. Wow. And, um, yeah, Alligator is a great label. I mean, as far as independent labels go, I, it, it was just really a special place. I can imagine. How did that yeah. come about? You know, um, there, there's a story with that because um, there was an article in Guitar Player Magazine um, by a guy, I forgot his name, but he was a guy who brought, uh, well, he was a producer down there and a college professor, and he a white guy, and he wrote an article about how white people could only be imitators in terms of the blues, and wow. that it was black music, and then, and then, you know, in response to that, a bunch of people wrote in letters, I mean, some saying stuff like, well, the blues is not black music, it's big leg women, it's this, that, and the other, and so <laughs> I wrote a letter saying, well, you know, I mean, I believe that it, music belongs to whomever loves it, mm. you know, but the music comes out of the black experience. Clearly there's no mistaking that and black people have a relationship to the blues that it is, is singular. And um, they wanted to print that as a guest editorial. I was wow. just writing a letter. And so they did. And one of the editors got in touch and he had heard about me from Vernon Reed and, and one thing led to another and he recommended us to Bruce Eglauer. Wow. And um, that's only the second time he ever recommended somebody to Bruce. Wow. And the first time was Dave Hole from Australia, a slide wow. player, and he got signed. And so we sent Bruce a demo that we had done with my larger band, with my sisters and brothers, Blues Land. And he heard, you know, good things, but he wasn't, you know, not, that didn't completely knock him out. But down the line, um, Brooklyn Lager used to have a band search, a, a book contest at Brooklyn, uh, at Celebrate Brooklyn every year. And we, you know, battles of the band are kind of, you know. Right, right. But one year they were doing blues. We said, hey, let's do it. We'll have some fun. We wound up winning it. And wow. one of the prizes was studio time to record something for the radio. But one of the engineers had some spec time coming. We did some blues land stuff. And then we did some blues mob stuff because mm. I had been gigging around town with a smaller unit doing classic blues as well as our originals and uh, basically we did a demo with brian his name was brian young good mm -hmm. friend sent that to bruce a glower and basically we got signed to alligator wow you hear that so you it know one happen. thing leading to another yeah yes yes wow so okay so now you had a slide a blues version of sly and the family stone 
pretty much in terms of you 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 were in a band prior to that moment going to Alligator Records and 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 winning that um um um, the, um competition the banter, yeah right you were in a band with your family. Your Absolutely, siblings. yeah. My my two sisters and my brother. We, my brother Kevin, my sisters Kathy and Wynette. Wow. We started the band in '73, wow. and um, Kevin was 14, Kathy was 15, uh, Wynette was 20. I was 21. And our parents used to come to the shows. They were very wow. incredibly supportive because Kathy and Wynette, I mean Kathy and Kevin, were underage. Right, right. right. And in those days, there were live music clubs in in the neighborhood in the Bronx and in in uh, Harlem and so forth. And we also played the dance halls, you know, for wow. social clubs. So I was extremely fortunate. Yeah, I mean that that was a, a very great time for music, and to speak to a, a lot of cats that came through New York, it was a great time for New York music as well. How was the New yeah. York blues scene in your journey? Well, you know, I didn't really get involved in the blues scene until a little bit later, and um, because, you know that we were playing R and B and funk and you know mm. and all of that, and then I really started writing a little bit later after I was playing with Sekou Sundiata, mm. and um, I joined that band and great band Vernon Reed, J T Lewis, Tony Bridges, and wow. doing Sekou's music. Doug Booth was a musical director wow. when I was invited to join that, and I was also playing with a band called Fitz and the New York Band doing some rock and roll stuff and for a long time I had been playing cover tunes a lot even though I wrote some and a, and a, it was a lot of people were saying you should start a blues band you know around that time because when we do a blues thing people right. seem to and and so I asked well you gonna join it and they said yeah so it was my brother Kevin on bass Tony Lewis wow. on drums and um well Doug Booth played keys but Fred McFarlane played keyboards with us wow. also they altered and um and so I started writing songs specifically with with blues in mind, but it always had other flavors. But that's how I got involved in playing like Pats and Chelsea right, and, right. and playing, because we were playing like CBGBs and right, right, Bitter right, End. Which and, was a big place, a big, big... Oh, serious independent. rock yeah. underground. And then, and then But with the blues mob, we played blues clubs where you actually made some money, like it was $50 or whatever. <laughs> and uh, we started playing Terra Blues in 90 or 91 when they first opened. And that's actually where Bruce Iglauer came to see us. Wow. So, wow. yeah, when we talk, he said, oh, what are you playing? I want to come see you. And, you know, the music business, he said, well, yeah, sure, you know, okay. <laughs> right, but, everybody said, well, come see you. <laughs> there we are at Terra Blues. He flew in from Chicago and came wow. to the gig, you know. And that's, so, that's serious business. Yes. So, so it, it was a gradual, um, and for the sake of argument, I'll ask you, all pretty much American music, comes from the blues or the blues predecessors, yes? Yeah, yeah. So that's it was my feeling. It, it was it was kind of a natural progression for you. Yeah, well I mean I started playing guitar because of Jimi Hendrix and there you um, go. <laughs> and I saw him five times and um I was seeing people in clubs. I mean, my friends in high school and I, we used to talk, argue about who's better, Clapton or Hendrix, all of this. And all of those guys, Mike Bloomfield, they always talked about B.B. King, Albert King, Freddie, Buddy Guy, all of their heroes. Right, right, and right. And so we used to see those guys, too, at clubs. Wow. And Bill Graham at the Fillmore East, he would have a double bill because we were into rock, but he'd have the Jefferson Airplane and Albert King. Mm. So we got exposed to all the blues guys, too. And even though blues was always my most direct connection to the guitar, you with my band with my brother and sisters we were playing R&B and popular music at the time right, right, right. we would go get the WWRL Soul 16 chart wow. learn some songs put the needle back and then play these gigs wow but blues we'd always slip into blues you know here you and there <laughs> and then it, and, and gradually uh, the way things evolved even though the band with my brother and my sisters blues land was my heart um you know the blues wound up that was where we wound up getting signed and and the thing that really connected the most in in terms of uh getting a label touring all of that wow that's serious now Jimi hendrix is the blues though right well as far as i'm concerned for well for me Jimi hendrix is sort of he he he's really um the 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 the, the genius of for me of Jimi hendrix well he brought together blues, R and B, and rock, you know, in a way that was organic mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. seamless because of, and it was, and it, and it was always, it's about the writing, you know. Right, right, he right. wrote great songs. He's also a great performer, great guitarist. You know, his voice had a beautiful tone, even though he didn't, he didn't take singing all that seriously right. then. 
but he he basically had it all a dynamic charismatic guy the, the couple of interactions i had with him one direct one indirect were all, he was amazing just an amazing wow. guy but it it, it when we were touring a lot with the blues mob, and we've been blessed. We toured uh, thirty countries, you know, mm. and and through our six albums, seven albums, and and young folks would ask, you know, what I what do I I play I play guitar, and I would always tell them two things: take your singing seriously, because all of the masters of the blues they sing at least as well as they play. That's right, <laughs> all of them. You so take singing seriously. But the other thing was write. You know, you've got to write because your writing is what's going to separate you from every other artist in the world. That's right. Because you have a story that only you can tell the way you're going to tell it. And that's what will be singular, it. you well, know. Well, let's let's stay, let's stay there for a second because what, that is a, a pivotal um, point to the blues, right? Amen. Because the blues is one story. It's o- almost like the origin origin of singer songwriters, right? Right, right. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Folks like, well, of course, Robert Johnson, but any number of people, they were writing their songs That's and right. singing, and the songs would be variations on each other's songs as well as fresh stuff. And but it all mattered because it was all of the spirit, and 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 it was, there was power there. You yes, know? that's right. Telling your story, your story, your way. That's and right. So, so you had mentioned. A, the article that you read and responded to. Yeah. That, um, um blues, God, well, Lawrence Hoffman is the guy who wrote the article. Lawrence Hoffman, Larry yeah. Hoffman. What's going on, Larry? I'm trying to get a show with this guy. Yeah, <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, he, he's, he's another music encyclopedia. Yes. You know, yes. The, the guy is really, so, Wow, that's very interesting. I did not know that. I'm sorry, that just threw well, me. Well, he's up. the one who brought Corey Harris to Alligator Records, you know. Wow. If I remember, you know. Wow. And so yeah, he wrote that article. Wow. Talk about legends. You're getting it all right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Corey Harris is another for ph- you guys are phenomenal guitarists. And I, I wanted yeah. to go somewhere about something else, but because you're a phenomenal guitarist and you just brought oh. up another one. Let's talk about that because, you know, as, as, and I hate to use this term, but for the sake of the example, a blues purist, a, a sorrow song and feel hollow purist, you, you tend to start believing, well, as long as you feel it and, and you got a, a style and a sound and it makes sense and you write your own song, you got it. But there is a technicality to the actual instrument that is very important. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, but the thing about music is that there's some something for everyone to love, you know, and there's so many different approaches because when I, again, when I was in high school and we were into the blues, we were into rock, we took us to the blues, but we were also listening to Pharrell Sanders mm. and John Coltrane and Miles mm. Davis and um that wasn't the music that I mean, I love that music, but it wasn't the music that made me want to, I didn't want to play that music enough right, right, to really, right, right. but the blues just touched me in a way. So, you know, what happens is that you have, I mean, you have George Benson, say, oh, who's boy. like, I mean, a ma- he's the master, I mean, in terms of technique, yes, feeling, right. knowledge, the whole thing. And jazz is very demanding music in terms of uh, of the knowledge you have to have, the harmony, the study, all of that. And, and it's amazing and I love it and beautiful. Blues is a different, it's a different kind of study. You right. know, you want to have technique. If you're doing, you know, a uh, slide guitar, whatever it is, you want to be able to do it well and, and, and sort of imitate your heroes. But you're not studying the same way in terms of harmony uh, that a jazz, uh, formal music that, a, that right. a lot of jazz players might, you know. So there's a different balance between how you live your life, the stories and the stories you tell, the writing, the approach. And for me, it's all valid. I mean, you know, I mean, if if I'm in the mood to hear Albert King, mm. say, or John Lee Hooker, who mm. don't have the vocabulary that somebody like George Benson has, right, right, right. you know, when I'm in the mood to hear them, you know, George Benson is it's a different thing. I want to hear Albert King. You want to hear that feeling. That's right. That's right. That's but right. then when I want to hear George Benson, I mean, it's hey George is, is you know what I mean? Yeah, any, he's very any, intricate. <laughs> any jazz guitar player. Well, George is my favorite because everything I've ever heard him play, no matter how complex, blues is always there. Mm. He is front and center. 
and there are a lot of really brilliant, you know, beautiful jazz guitar players. Uh, there was a black rock coalition band called Blueprint, mm. and um, and Mark Gilmore and David Gilmore were in that band, and um, David Gilmore is a guitarist, and this right. was like mid '80s, and we were on the first black rock coalition album together. Oh wow! Blueprint, my band Bluesland. The other day, I played an event for Bailey's Cafe as a fundraiser, and David Gilmore was playing with the, the artist on the show, and. Great. He's been teaching at Juilliard for eight wow. years. So he plays a whole lot of beautiful guitar. And it's just amazing and inspiring to see. Absolutely. You Absolutely. Know? Wow. So so there are so many approaches. And the thing for me also is my my first connection with music is emotional. Absolutely. You know, it's how it feels, you know. And then there's a degree where I like to try to know what I'm doing and get better and be cons- more consistent with my chops and all of that. But it's always going to be the emotional thing for me. Right, right. So that which goes back to, I guess, the foundation of the blues because it's built around uh at least as the folklore goes around the feeling well i mean for me i i used to, i i've thought of it in terms of, of of a folk music you know music that's handed down from person to person you know and um and and that's what rock was for a long time and r&b all of it but now you can go to school and study to be a great rock guitarist or a great right. blues you can there now it's become more formalized as classical music only what only classical music was at one point right. now jazz rock there are schools where you can play guitar all Kenny you know and that's great you know yeah. people, you know you know I, I'm I, I'm all for people doing what they love, you know. Yeah, that would make whatever the place a more happier. It. <laughs> be a happier world. And I always tell people too, if you're gonna start playing guitar, I recommend getting a teacher and studying with somebody because you can get places a lot quicker. You know? Yeah, than doing it on your own. Trust me. Yes. <laughs> but I, I guess, or, or at the same time, uh, kind of figuring it out gives you a unique distinctive style then well making sure there's a lot to be said for originality for, right. for me that's the most one of the most important things and one of the most important things i learned from Jimi hendrix he Absolutely. was a complete original nobody said nobody nobody was sounding like that at that time and yeah. nobody was bringing rock blues and soul together that way r&b and um or, or for that matter john lee hooker albert king bb king freddie king buddy guy any you can name all of the great blues elmore james people they sound like themselves. That's they don't right. sound like everybody else. And you can hear they were connected, but, you know, so for me, originality has always been big, too. It's key. Now, with that being said, because the guys that you've mentioned, in terms of Jimmy, uh, uh, Johnny, Albert, um, Elmore James, these guys um, had did really simple things but made it, sound so intricate. When I say simple, I'm not by no means minimizing what they were doing. And and I get into that because I like to talk to guitarists about this. The difference between uh, uh, having an emotion and a feel behind your bend or whatever, and then this new idea, or I'd like to call this this rock or alternative blues idea of all the shredding, because right. th- these cats that you name weren't necessarily just doing guitar tricks for right. like eight measures or three, four, five minutes. They were li- they were actually in in pocket. Right, you, you know, and and for me, there's a place for all of it because you know, again, I mean, I listen to Albert King, I mean, and and just or, or BB, of course, and or Otis Rush. Mm. I was listening his vibrato, you mm-hmm. know, and he tells a story, and it's almost, almost like he rarely, rarely plays anything really fast, and that's. But on the other hand, I listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan, and the feeling is unmistakable. <laughs> the groove, the feeling, the tone, the passion. Amazing guitar player. Or Johnny Winter. I remember the first time I ever heard yeah. him. I was like, whoa, whoa. It's a blizzard of notes. But it's the feeling is still there. Well, I mean, right. he's got his voice, the slide, the whole right. thing. He, he had a package. Right, right. So there there are ways. I mean, I, I you know, two of my favorite guitar players are um, Vernon Reed and um, Eric Johnson. Mm. And they both play a lot of notes. But they're not playing the same notes everybody else plays. You know, they don't, you, you hear you. Vernon. There's no mistaking. This is something else. You hear Eric Johnson. Okay, he's got a thing. One of the things. I mean, and and all due respect to anybody who plays. I love people who play. Period. But a lot of people play 
fast, but they're sort of playing what everybody else plays, but they're playing it faster or right. whatever. And that's cool because one of the things that happens is, especially at live shows, I mean, most every great guitar, good guitar player I know is trying to play less notes. You know? But you get on stage and there's a certain energy and there's excitement to, right. to the, so you're, it's a different dynamic. I, when I play in the studio, if I'm recording, I'm looking for something different you know, it's, it's still me. It's still trying to do what I do. But on stage, okay, you'll do th- some faster stuff because you're trying to have a moment. Exactly. You know, and, and getting the the because now let's stick there for a minute because now the difference. Well, I'm not going to say. It, I'm asking you, what is the difference, right? Because when you're live and on stage, you have that um, energy coming back to you from the audience. But when you're in the studio, it's kind of more of a controlled environment. Well, yeah, it is. And with, and one thing about the studio is whatever you play, if you're playing for your album or you're on somebody else's, that recording is going to be heard over and over again. And so you try to do something maybe uh, that that is is what you do, what you worked on, but try to be a little imaginative. For me, lyricism is important and trying to do something – in the moment that's that's special, you know, where on stage you do some of that, but then you also then you know get that rhythm thing going and and then then quick stuff that people enjoy and gets audiences excited because the emotions in the moment that are coming back are different and it's a moment and it's unless you're making a live album, I guess I would play different. Well, I did we did do a live album and I played kind of differently, although it it was still live but in the studio yeah there are different things i have different intentions got you different intentions yeah i hear that so now let me ask you this in in, in regards to um live yeah right so now somebody owns the album right and and just like most of us, there's one or two or maybe even ten cuts that we really love that song repeat over and over and over <laughs> right. again, right? You know yeah. how that goes. Yeah. And then when you go, as that fan, you go to the show, you kind of want to hear the live version the same way it's on the album. What do you feel about that as a blues, just as a musician who plays live often, do you give it to them the same way or is it something different every time when it's live? Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I feel fortunate in terms of blues and, and a lot of music is this way too. Live, I mean, the live thing is a different experience right. and you want to touch those same emotions in it, but it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a different experience. And one of the things I've, I've realized is that if you, well, we record, we might have keyboards, we might have horns on a song or two or whatever. When you play live, we used to have keyboards that then became a trio. Right. One of the things I found I find is that people fill in stuff that's not there if they really love a record. Right. I remember my brother and I once standing outside a club in the Bronx back way back in the day and this band was playing Barry White's song, mm. A Love Unlimited. Did it right? And we're outside listening and thinking, Wow, man, he's like it turned out it was a trio. Wow. And they were singing the melody. They were singing the melody. Da-da-da-da. But wow. not looking at them, we're hearing all this music and you realize, wait, you fill in stuff too. It's so, um, it, it's I, I think the other thing again, music that's recorded is meant to be listened to a lot of times. Mm. And so, and so you there's a, you might want to have certain details, a certain ear candy that touches somebody a certain way, and you don't have the advantage of whatever energy and interaction happens in a room right. where you're playing and whatever energy you might bring to the stage. Right, that organic. Yeah. Moment. Wow. Now, and the other thing I must say, I mean, certain pop music, the, the the deal is to have it sound exactly like the record, right? And that's cool. That's a different thing. If I you go see Michael Jackson or, or whatever act that has a lot of choreography and whatever, right, right. they can, you know, but he's gonna bring you something magical in a different kind of way, right? Right. His his, his, his the, the dancing and the stage show will make up for here. Oh, the singing, you. the whole, you know, and they might have a couple of things. Well, well, they, yeah, he actually always did have some stuff that was different from the record, but people want that sa- that sound. Right, was, right, yeah. that Billy Jean. Yeah, now, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're on great guitarists and blues, which I believe it was Johnny Hooker who said that the uh, rock and roll is just the blues sped up. Wasn't that Johnny Lee Hooker who said <laughs> oh, that? It might have, might have been, <laughs> you know. Yeah. 
what's your thought about Prince Roger Nelson, the artist formerly known as Rest in Peace, by the way? I thought Prince, he was a he was like a once in a lifetime artist. You know, he was, you know, Michael Jackson was a once in a lifetime artist too, in a different way, had a right. whole different arc and life. But he was bril- absolutely brilliant. Prince, um, I mean, his musicality from early on, you know, I want to be your lover, all that That's stuff. Right. You know, he's playing guitar, keyboards, bass, all of this. And playing them really well too, <laughs> and then he had such a such a long career and constantly making music, constantly, you know, he was doing a three hour show and then go jam somewhere, you know, yeah. take his own. I mean, and and there 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 is Prince music that I absolutely love, you know. And for a long time, I wasn't really connected to listening to Prince. Like I'd hear stuff and it's cool, but then when he passed, it was like, it's, it it was. Well, it was shocking, really, because, I mean, Michael Jackson and Prince were around my whole life. Right. From when I was, like, a teenager, they were stars and doing great music and doing great things. And then you'd be in listening to it more, and then you'd be listening to other things. Doing, But when Prince passed, it was, I mean, he was a singular artist um, in terms of the writing, the playing, the singing, playing multiple instruments, the dancing. He's the only person I've ever known who he could do a show like a Jimi Hendrix type show, playing guitar, right, tearing right. it up. And then he could do a James Brown show, just up right. there at the mic, <laughs> doing the dancing and leading the band and doing all of that whole thing. I've never. There's nobody else I've seen who did both of those Not to at that the level. top level. Yeah, you know, yeah. and 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 then he did his. He could sit down and play the piano and do a show that way. And, and do a little Richard. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? So, so yeah. I wow. That's and true. and played some blues too. It was serious. Played a lot about of blues. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah, he was. I mean, yeah, Prince is extremely special as an artist. It did. And coming to find out about what a humanitarian he was when he passed, after he right. passed, too, it's like, this guy was ex- really special. The extraordinary. Yes. Now, I, I want to talk about uh, how you put an album together, because you mentioned a couple of things that are very key, just in, in terms of musicianship and, and being a professional uh, musician in, in terms of recording albums and performing, right? Okay. So you, you mentioned intentions when you go into the studio, um, interactions and, and relationships on stage. When you sit down to write an album, so this is kind of two-part. When you sit down to write an album, when you sit down to write a song, just one song or record, are, are you thinking about either all the intentions or are you just organically feeling it or are you saying to yourself, okay, we're going to make an album, and I kind of want to talk about, for example, I want to, I want to do a New York blues album, so then you just kind of write all these songs in regards to that. How does that work for you? Well, you know, the first Blues Mob album came about, um, well, some of the songs we had played with Blues Land, you know, in our Black Rock Coalition days, with, the, with the, you know, CBGBs and all the different clubs, and... Um, for me, by the time I had started doing that kind of the writing with Blues Land, and the, um, I I did kind of have have this thought of original New York style blues because, um, and because I was fortunate, my brother is a great bass player, still is, and um, we played with Tony Lewis, amazing. So I had all these amazing musicians who had all played funk, they played blues, they played R and B, they played rock, they played reggae. Mm. And so when I was writing, those different energies came into the music a lot, and and so that's what blues blues land and and the blues mob were, you know. And our first album, it didn't sound like every other blues album right. or any other blues album, but but it, uh, yeah, and and there were sto- and and I guess at that time too, my feeling was there are stories that that really should be told. Um, and also focusing on songs that uh, in praise of women, and you know, but songs like "Can't Recall a Time" or "Why We Play the Blues" or, or singing songs about Eleanor Bumpers being killed in the by the police in the Bronx, that mm. the elderly woman who's you know, or mm-hmm, Howard mm-hmm. Beach when the three guys were killed. That's you right. know, that was a big part of what we did. So social consciousness was very much on our minds with blues yeah. land and the blues mob. Now it. it Social con- social context and content in your music w- was that because of the time you were in, because based on 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 
your, your journey, there was a lot of, of things happening that would make people more socially socially conscious. So do you think that yeah. was kind of... Well, well, I mean, I, my parents raised us to be very aware of the civil rights movement when that okay. was happening. Later on in high school, I was out there protesting the Vietnam War. Really? And attending Black Panther rallies. And wow. So we're very politicized. And so when when it came time to do our, my own, our own music, that was definitely going to be part of it right, at that time. Right, right, and right. it felt like... It was important for the blues mob to be to to be to follow the tradition of doing songs that represented the voices of people who didn't really have much voice in society. Right. So we so that was a big part of our intent, and as well as I mean, you want your shows and you want music to be joyful, and Absolutely. joyous. Absolutely. So we always had a sense of hope, you know, in the songs somewhere and right. You know, some, was, some type of resolve. Now. You, you mentioned a lot that has to do with the what I like to call African American tribal music and the Black experience, the traditions. Yeah. But the one thing that we haven't discussed, the church. Were you were, did, you and your siblings? Did you guys play in the church as well? Were you in the choir? Did you even go to church? Well, yeah, we, <laughs> we grew up, up in the Lutheran church, and it's very funny. I mean, my brother and I came to a point where we said. Nah, that's not the answer, you know. <laughs> and then my sisters still go to church. You know, they're in the middle. I'm the oldest, he's the youngest. They're in the middle. They're still going to church, and both of us are, like, following other paths, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I mean, I guess, I mean, I see the value and the power it's had, you know, for folks because it's, 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 um, it, it it's connected folks to 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 hope in yeah. times where there wasn't much and, and that kind of stuff, you know, and that's, that's, so it serves a purpose. And, I, you know, for me, at this point in my life, religion, what people say doesn't really matter. People, I'm this, I'm that, I'm born again, I do this, I'm that. Eh, eh. You know, talk is cheap. Yeah. For me, what matters is what people do. You know, that's what really matters. For me, whatever else anybody does to be happy, good for them, you know. And um, so, yeah, but but so and the Lutheran church, we weren't we weren't doing the gospel music and right. stuff. We were singing Bach and my sister went that night and <laughs> yeah, these descants and, and you know, and it, and, it, and it's cool. It's music, you know, right. but <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I the, the 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 church is isn't well, I mean, I guess if you're if you're black and you live in America and you're doing blues, the church is there somewhere. I mean, it's all, you, you know what yeah. I mean? But it's not an, a, a big conscious source of, of inspiration right. for me in terms of, well, yeah, I guess in general, you know, no, I dig it. I, I mean, dig it. I dig it. Now, Brooklyn Blues is a guitarist too. Do, do you want to get yeah. in on this conversation? Do you, do, do you yeah. want to ask brother Michael Hill, two time New York hall of famer, you want to ask him a question? Yes, I do have a question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> good. Hey, now. How you doing? Good, good, good. Thank you. Good to see you. I would like to know for an aspiring blues musician like myself and others, what advice would you have to bring the blues current? Like, in, in terms of, would it be the, uh, the progression? Would it be the sounds of the music? Would it be the content and the lyrics? To bring it current to get a younger generation kind of into the blues as well. Um... You Good know, question. yeah, that's a great question because uh, I, I, I mean, my first thought is the stories you tell. But mm. then again, that's not on the basis of knowing what's pop. See, because I'm not really in touch with the most pop, you know, what the latest, what people are up. I mean, I hear stuff my son plays, you know, and it's all interesting. I don't necessarily hear a whole lot of stuff that I'd necessarily play again on my own, <laughs> you know, but there's stuff that's cool. And sometimes yeah. there's stuff that like, okay, I just, wow, what was, I was in at my job in the kitchen in, in, uh, in the lunchroom cafeteria back there and they were playing, uh, not WWRL, whatever the station is, BLS, I guess. And they were playing, there was a song, it was absolutely gorgeous. And it turns out it was by Beyonce's sister. Uh, yes. So I, I forgot the name of the song, but I, but I would definitely buy that, you know. So there, I hear certain things, but in terms of 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 making blues something that is 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 that touches the ears and hearts of of, of a younger generation, I I'm I don't really have the answer for that. I I think the if you're playing blues though, I'd, I, I the 
the first thing you want to do is play what you love and what really moves you and touches your heart. Um, and then, I mean, I would recommend be at least being aware of what people are listening to now. Because when we were playing blues, too, we were also listening to Funkadelic and Earth, Wind & Fire. And, you know, and so we could have done certain things, you know, and those, you know. Well, it's hard not to listen to Earth, Wind & Fire. <laughs> right, right. And so whatever the equivalents are now in terms of popularity, you know, be aware of those and see what ways they can organically work with what you do. Because the flavor is that, you know, we have a couple of tunes on our albums that have an African high life groove. Mm. And there's one about Eleanor Bumpers, who the grandmother who got killed in the Bronx. Right, right. That's a reggae thing, you know. And those were things we all played, you know. So when it came to writing, I could bring these flavors in because I was playing with folks who knew and what it was. And so, so that kind of thing, you know, having people who are versed in what's happening now, and you yourself being versed, and again, the intention to like communicate something meaningful, you know, to young folks. Well, you know, it, I'm, I, I'm, if you have another question, just give me one second, because based on what, what you just said, your answer to that question, it, it leads me to ask you, like most movements, and it doesn't have, you know, this is colorless. We, we're going to cross the lines on this. We could talk about. Um, the Ramones, we could talk about the Fugees, uh, we, we could talk about um, uh, uh, Sun House, Gishi Wild. Memphis Minnie doesn't really fit into this because her catalog of mute, her body of work is just so tremendous. Yeah. She, so I, I can't mention her, but but these these groups. Um, what is the um, a band called? Was it a band called? Death, these groups that just really started out with a cult following, right? right. <clears throat> My question is, so to, to, I guess I'm piggybacking off of Brother Brooklyn. If you just keep your music and, and sound and the entire package honest to who you are and what Ever it is you represent, would that break through out, out out of trying to figure out or listen to current sounds? Um, you know, it's hard to say because at the end of the day, there's a lot to be said for being in the right place at the right time. Mm. <laughs> you know, and knowing mm. people because there are things that have been very successful that another time might not have been. Right, and and things. Oh, sorry, and and things that you know, weren't successful and looked like sure things, you know. And even when people are playing the music they love, you know, well, the police, they do, hey, okay, we got, we all have blonde hair. There's a look here right, and right, certain, right, right, right. that contributes to the whole thing. Hendrix, you know, the look, the dress, the way, this whole thing, and it was him. But, it, you know, you're conscious of like, okay, this is something audiences look at, you know. Um, it's funny with the blues mob when we were deciding what look to have we didn't want to wear suits but we didn't want to wear jeans look like we just stepped off the street so we wore African vests and, mm. and we had stuff made and the audiences loved it you know wow. meanwhile blues festival promoters and stuff well, well uh, what's with the African print clothes <laughs> our agent told us well a band might be too serious you know all of this kind of stuff so for the first three years we were with an agent who d didn't couldn't get us booked in the, at a lot of festivals and in the South. We didn't do much of that or the West Coast. And, you know, and we, well, we switched agents, that changed. But by then we had done three albums on Alligator and that was the time to make that, really make the that move. move. But um, it was, yeah, so it was ironic. The same thing that like made gatekeepers of festivals and stuff kind of hesitant was something that audiences appreciated, mm. you know, all audiences. I mean, somebody once asked me, you know, well, how does it feel to play, you know, these blues and play shows and your people aren't there? And I, you know what? The people who are there loving our music, that's my people, you know? Because, <laughs> you know, for anybody to step outside their house and sit and share an hour or two or three with you listening to what you have to say and giving you energy and love, well, you know, it's hard to have a better group of people that you can have. You know what I mean? No, and I there's do all understand. these levels. And so, 
you know, it, it's um. Well, let me ask you this question because th- that's something that um. I debate about a lot, (laughs) as well as discuss with uh, other musicians. I had the opportunity to sit down with Guy Davis. Oh, man, Guy's a friend. Oh, wow. Great guy. Guy guy is, man, Guy is bad. (laughs) Oh, yes, indeed. (laughs) I love Guy. Um, He said something similar to what you stated, whereas, you know, the audience didn't necessarily look like him. And it's not that he had an issue with that because of the fact that everything you just said, pretty much. Yeah. But... The one thing he said that stuck out was, and this was at a you know at a different time. He said, but then you know he would look down and maybe see a couple, one or two or three uh, black folk, and he just had a, a little moment with those three individuals as in yeah. But it wasn't to take away from the body of people who may have been non African American that came to support him. Of course, yeah. You know what? All the love you get is great. And and if and if there's love coming from folks with whom you have this other thing in common and this that adds to it. It all just makes it even more special, you know. But what what do you think of, do do you outside of, of being appreciative of any and everybody cuz that is so, you know somebody's really taking their time yeah. to come hear you. That's something to be respected and honored. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, of course. But do do you at some point or in any point I, I just wish more people that this music came from would come out and support it, whether they're old or young. You know, hey, it would be fantastic. The more <laughs> folks we see at the shows, it's always special because there's a there's a different connection. You know, we play uh, in Europe or Beirut or whatever. Mm. People love this music. Could be the, for me, the bottom line is that music is a spiritual thing. Period. So it transcends whatever. And then there's the, the mundane level of things where you're making connections and relationships with people on the planet at, mm. this, at this time. And so there's a connection with other black folks that's different than your connection with anybody else. And yeah, it's, it's always really wonderful when folks are there. And a lot of times... If there is even a different kind of response, you know, although, yeah, I mean, I guess among people, they're they're white folks who act like black folks when it comes to listening to music, they just get up in it, you know, but yeah, it's always great to see, you know, to see black folks at our shows and because um, the blues is not the current popular music right. you know and so it's like jazz you know for people to come out they, they they made an effort to not only know this music it hit them some kind of way they stayed with it That's they right. buy it they support it they you know they love it you know and so and and so yeah it's always really special no, that's cool. now it's funny because a lot of people say that you know i, I know we've all heard that uh, keep the blues alive or we're keeping the blues alive or the blues is not a, a popular genre. But every time I turn on the TV or any time I watch specific movies, whether it's a commercial or whatever, this blues, <laughs> yeah. it, you know, from from quote unquote electric Chicago blues, you know, to to deep down south acoustic blues is always somehow um um a score to something well yeah well you know for me the blues is, is one of the foundational um elements of american culture you know yeah, absolutely. and so whether it's poetry theater uh visual arts there's a blues sensibility that's penetrated that's there and it's american and people know it when they see it and hear it and feel it and so to so then the music it it, it be also becomes um, it signifies something, you know. If if you're watching a show and there's blues playing, it feels a certain way. Yeah. Same thing with jazz. Absolutely. You know, you'll be watching something and and they'll have a jazz track on it. It means a certain thing. You hear you see, you you hear classical music. You know, it has Absolutely. so it all all of these things because because there's great power in the music. You know, so so the realm of popular music and what gets sold is a whole separate thing from the fact that blues is one of the foundations of American culture. Right. And that sensibility is going to be there, whether it's as background music, whether it's in the writing of a play, whether it's in poetry, a, 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 a novel, whatever, it's going to be there, you know. Mm, I dig it. You got, you, do you have another question, Brother Brooklyn? No, 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 I'm good. 
Oh. <laughs> so, well, so in, in, in rapping, um, that you you stated to Brooklyn when he asked uh, about up up and coming artists, and then you also stated what you you told um, artists that would come up to his shows. Right. What is a, a, a last piece of advice or suggestion? It doesn't matter if they're musicians; just anybody that that is is working towards something. What would be your your suggestion or piece of advice? Whoa, okay. Um, you know, I've come to a point in life where, I mean, and this is for me, I've come to realize that being happy is the most powerful place you can be in terms of anything you want to do, you know. And so, and I read, I read a thing once that, you know, to be happier, pay attention to what you like. Mm. You know, you can be aware of everything, but what you accentuate, that's a different thing. And it determines your quality of life, determines what you see next. It determines what comes next. You know, so I highly recommend for people to figure out a way to be happy and to be joyous, you know, and and then do what you do in the world. You know, I mean, and it's not like, you know, you, you're aware of everything, but what your foundational connection to the world and to life is that place of joy, you know, and love. Oh, I, dig it. I dig it. Now, please share with everybody where they could find you, shows, social media, website. You know, once I stopped touring, I, I did still keep a website up for a while. Then it got to, it's like, I just don't have time to do this. I, we don't have, our Blues Mob website is not up right now. I work in a high school in the daytime, I gig. I play at Terra Blues a few times a month. I'm sort of in the rotating house bands there. And also at Lucille's at B.B. King's on Tuesday nights, the Harlem Blues Project, you mm. know, Jerry Duggar, Junior Mack, and mm -hmm. Barry Harrison. So they have a guest every week. And I do that once a month or so. And then there, uh, when blues mob gigs come up, I, some, I put something on Facebook or whatever. But um, um, I guess I'm, I'm writing, as I mentioned earlier, for a new blues mob album. And um, that uh, working out the process of doing a day job and writing still, because I used to write after midnight. Mm. Now I'm trying to be in bed by 10 o'clock to get up <laughs> at like 5.30. So, but that adventure is happening. But, you know... Um, yeah, Facebook, uh, I try to put some things on, and, and I do mailings if it's something with the blues mob that's really... But um, and our music is on Amazon and iTunes, and as I tell audiences, you don't even have to get the whole album. You know, if you're cheap or frugal, you know, <laughs> twenty nine, you can get your favorite check. We got some great songs, you know. So, so. so you heard it right here. <laughs> <laughs> thank well, you. You know, I thank you and Brooklyn, man. You guys are incredibly gracious. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, sir. Again, we're sitting with two-time New York Hall of Famer Michael Hill. And we're going to be right back with you. <laughs>